Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. Today, Sunday, February 15th, 2015, is the very last and final day of this 40-day campaign that we've been doing together as a church. This is the last day. And that means that come midnight tonight, uh, we will be moving from what will be the 40th day. Midnight tonight, we'll be moving from day 40 to our 41st day. And of course, the whole timeline for this series is just 40 days. I mean, that's what we called it. We didn't call it 400 days in the Word. We didn't call it 4,000 days in the Word. We called it 40 days in the Word. And so because of that, The question I want to ask you this morning is just what are you going to do when the clock strikes midnight tonight? What are you going to do? I want you to think about that. Are you going to stay as committed and connected, as as focused and engaged, as determined and sold out to the principles and truths that we've been talking about all through this series? Are you going to do that? Stay committed and focused so that 40 days turns into 41? 41 turns into 42? 43 turns into 403? 403 turns into 4,553? Amen? How many think that would be pretty good? The question I'm asking you this morning in this series of 40 days, are you going to stick with it? Stick with it. Or are you going to allow yourself to slowly, and usually that's how it starts, slowly begin to drift and disconnect until much of what we've covered in these past 40 days becomes nothing more than just a faded distance memory and they're no longer an active part of our lives? That's the question I want all of us to think about this morning. Um, What am I going to do once these 40 days are over? And of course, our prayer as pastoral staff for all of you uh, would be that you would stay just as committed, just as committed and passionate, just as sold out and connected to God and His Word when the series is over as you have been all the way through the series. That's our prayer. So that think about it. Over time, 40 days would turn into 40 weeks. How many think that'd be pretty good? 40 weeks would turn into 40 months. You think that'd be great to see happen in your life? And then 40 months turn into 40 years. 40 years. It's kind of like what Pastor Sheldon talked about in his offering message, right? That we would become unmovable, unshakable. You know, that's our prayer. And really, that's what I want to talk about this morning as we wrap up this 40-day In the Word series. I want to talk about how to make it stick In fact, the title of my message is Integrating God's Word in My Life. How to integrate God's Word in my life. And you know, the word integrate in the Webster Dictionary literally means to merge, to blend, to combine, to unite. That's what it means, to merge, to blend, to unite, uh, to, to, to combine. And really, that is the goal that we ought to have when it comes to God and His Word in our life. That we want it to become unified within us. We, We want it to become an integral part of who we are and what we do. That's the goal in all of this. It's what we call integration. It's the very opposite of segregation. And segregation means to divide and separate. It means to uh, detach and isolate. It's when we take all the various parts and pieces of our lives and we separate them. Right? And some people live segregated lives. That this is my personal life and this is my business life. They're separated. That this is my church life and this is my home life. This is my sex life. This is my business life. Some people live their lives that way. That is called segregation, not integration. And that's never the way God wants us to live. Matter of fact, the word integration comes from the very word integrity which means to be whole. God wants us to be whole people. He wants to bring wholeness in our lives. He wants us to be people of integrity. And you can't do that unless you make a goal. It's a goal. It's it's intentionally saying, I am 
going to integrate God's word in every part of my life. And of course, you see this, this call of integration all through the Bible. You know that when the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, got delivered, and went through the Red Sea. In, in, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, God gave them this call. They, he said, you must, you must. He said, you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. In other words, this was an invitation of integration. He says, the commandments that I'm giving you today, you must commit yourself to. How do you do that? How do you integrate these commandments into our lives? Well, he says, repeat them again and again to your children. That's integration. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. In the next verse, it says, fix these words of mine in your heart and your mind. Tie them as symbols on your head and bind them on your, uh, uh, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. And basically what God is saying is I want you to have a passion. He said to his people, I want you to be passionate and intentional when it comes to merging and integrating my word into your life. That we are to repeat it over and over again, not just every Christmas and Easter. Right over and over, that, that, that we're to talk about it when we're at church and when we're at home and when we're on the road and when we go to bed and when we get up. That's integration, that we are to fix his word on our hearts and minds, tie it as a symbol on our hands and on our forehead. That's what integration is all about. You know, of course, what some of the Jews have done is they've taken this command and they have interpreted it literally, some of the Orthodox Jews. And so you see them. Some Orthodox Jews, they actually take part of the Bible and they strap it to their heads. They do. I mean, I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying that's what they do. Or they take parts of the Bible and they tie it to their arm. I mean, that's what they do, and yet how many think there might be a better way when it comes to integrating God's Word in our life than physically wearing it on our head, physically binding it to our body parts? How many think there might be a better way? Amen. Okay, and so we're going to look at that better way, the better way, the process of word integration. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 1. And this is where we're going to be for the rest of our time together. Mark 4, verse 1. And you know, this is a, a teaching Jesus gave early on in his ministry. Um, it's commonly referred to as the parable of the sower. And hands down, it has to be one of the most well-known, familiar parables in all the Bible. It's very well-known. Matter of fact, even as we're turning to it right now, some of you are already starting to tune out and disconnect from what I'm saying. Okay, because you're saying to yourself, I know. You're saying to yourself, you know, Pastor, I've heard this, I've read this, I've listened to this parable so many times before. I don't think I could get anything fresh and new out of it. Some of you are actually thinking that. I'm a mind reader, I know that. You're thinking that. I mean, I've been in this portion of Scripture so many times before. How could I ever get anything fresh and new from it? Well, I believe that because God's Word is a living Word, you can. You can. And so I want to encourage you to stay with me this morning. How many will do that this morning? You'll stay with me. You'll stay engaged. Because I believe that God wants to speak some fresh things to us through this parable when it comes to the process of word integration, turning 40 days into 4,485 days. I believe God has something to say. And so are you ready? You're ready for that? Turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to learn something new. Just tell them that. Something new, something fresh. Mark 4. Verse 1, it says, Once again Jesus began teaching by the lake shore, and a very large, large crowd soon gathered around him, and he got in the boat. And when he sat in the boat, while well, all the people remained on the shore. Verse 2, And he taught them by telling them many stories in the forms of parables such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed, 
And as he gathered, scattered it across the field, some of the seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seeds fell along shallow soil, underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon withered under the hot sun, and since it did not have deep roots, it died. Other seeds fell among thorns and grew up and, and that cho- grew up and choked out the tender plant, so they proceeded to produce no grain. Still other seeds fell among fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100-fold times as much as had been planted. Okay, a very familiar portion of Scripture. And you know, for years, I'll be honest, for years, I used to think that the four different soils that Jesus is talking about here in this parable represented four different kinds of people who have the opportunity to hear God's Word. For years, I believed it. That here you have stony people, right? Hard people. And then you have shallow people where the the word doesn't take root, and then you have thorny people who have so many distractions in their life, and then you have the people who are productive and fruitful, and they they hear the word of God, and they produce 60, 30, 60, 100 fold. For years, I used to think that this parable was all about four very distinct and separate kinds of people. But you know, the longer I've walked with God, and the more I've become aware of my own shortcomings and defects, and that's a good thing to do, to come to a place of, of awareness. You know, I'm convinced that the different soils that Jesus is talking about here in this parable don't just represent four different individuals when it comes to God's Word, but rather, and I want you to hear me this morning, rather they are different kinds of attitudes and mindsets that are very much present and alive in every single one of us. In other words, all four soils are talking about us. It's about us. And you know, what I want to do this morning is I want to look at these four soils when it comes to how we tend to respond to the sowing of God's Word in our own lives. That's what I want to do. And so the first kind of soil that I see here is the hardened soil. And you know, this really represents what I call the closed mind. A closed mind, a closed and narrow mind. And when I say closed mind, I'm not necessarily talking about someone who's anti-God and anti-Christ and anti-church and anti-Bible. I'm not talking necessarily about people like that. But rather, when I refer to the closed mind here, I'm talking about all the places and parts that are inside of me. No doubt inside of you that are narrow and hard and closed off to God and His Word. These are the hardened, narrow places within us, and we all have them. It's an attitude that says that um, we're not open. We're not open, we're not listening to receiving what God has to say when it comes to this particular area of my life. I'm not open to God. And where we're not open to God and open to listening and receiving, that is called hard soil. It's a closed mind. And all of us have areas in our lives that are like that. That God, I don't want to hear what you have to say to me about my debt. I don't want to hear that. Even though I keep spending and accumulating more of it, I don't want to hear about it. I just keep buying things I don't need in order to impress people I don't like. And God, I know my debt is killing me, but I don't want to hear what you have to say about that. Speak to me in a different area. Uh, You know, that is called the hard soil of a closed and narrow mind. I don't want to hear God speak in this area of my life. That God, I don't want to hear what you have to say about my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Even, you, even though you know, I know they're not a good influence on me, they always seem to be taking me in the wrong direction. I don't want to hear what you have to say about them to me, but God, feel free to talk to me about any area of my life, but when it comes to that thing, that thing, and all of us have a thing, it's off limits. That is called the hard soil of a closed and narrow mind. And so I want you to think about maybe what's some areas of your 
hard soil might be. Think about it. I mean, we all have them. It could be marriage, family. It could be unforgiveness towards someone, right? It could be uh, an unwillingness to deal with destructive, addictive habits in our lives. It could be a whole myriad of things. Um, And what God desires us to do to become fully integrated into His Word is to pinpoint those areas of hardness within us so that He can see His Word start to take root and grow. Amen? Amen? And, you know, the only remedy really for that is what I call the action step of cultivating an open mind. An open mind. And an open mind means that when I read the the Bible, when I'm in the Bible and I read something that I don't necessarily agree with or makes me uncomfortable, rubs me the wrong way, in fact, it even makes me angry and mad when I'm in the Bible and I see things like that that convict me and upset me, What I do is I don't just close it. Rather than closing myself off and rejecting it, I take the actions of having an open heart, an open mind, saying, God, even though I don't necessarily like what you're saying to me right now, right? I don't like it. It doesn't feel good at all. I just read a scripture in the Bible where I'm supposed to do something I don't like. It's, it's going to make me feel uncomfortable. It's going to minimize the level of convenience that I've been experiencing in my life. It might take me out of my comfort zone. And God, even though it doesn't feel good and I don't like it, I am going to have an open and receptive mind. God, come and break up the hard and narrow places that are in me. That is the action step when it comes to dealing with the hard places of our lives. It's an invitation to have an open mind, allowing God to come and and have His way with us. You know, Hosea the prophet talked about that very thing. He said, plant good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a good crop of love. This is talking about word integration. Planting good seeds that in time will bring a bountiful harvest of love. And yet, how do you do that? Well, he tells us, plow up the what kind of ground? Plow up the hard ground, the hard ground, not of your wife's heart, not of your kids' hearts, not of your boss's heart. It says plow up the hard ground of your own heart, your heart. For now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon us. That is the key. In other words, what I want you to do this morning, this might be great homework, is when you go home this week, think about the areas right now that you are resisting God in. They could be subtle, and you might not want to say it. No Christian wants to say, yeah, I'm fighting with God. Yeah, I'm a rebel. Yeah, I don't do half the things he tells me. You know, we don't say it, but there's parts of us that live it. And so I want to encourage you to go home this week. Think about the areas of your life right now that are resistant and hard to God and his word, his truth, and in the spirit of humility, Invite God to come and break up the hardened ground. He'll do it. He's just, he's just itching to do it. You know, that really is the, the first step in word integration. It's the hard soil that needs an invitation to come and be broken up. You know, the, the second one we see here is what, what is called the shallow soil. That represents the superficial mind. It's a superficial mind, and you see it here in verse 16. Jesus said, the seed, the seed on rocky soil are those who hear the message and immediately they receive it with joy. These are pump people. They receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing the word. I wonder how many times this very thing happens to us. I know it's happened to me, right? Where you hear a sermon or read something in the Bible, you discover a truth, and you get all excited and fired up about it, right? It might be a teaching on the importance of prayer, 
right? Or, 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 or some teaching on how to, how to have a better marriage or the blessing of tithing or, or the joy of, of being a servant, maybe serving in an area of ministry in the church. We, you hear it, you read it, you receive it, and, and, and you're joyful about it. And you say to yourself, come hell or high water, I'm going to live this principle out in my life. But how many of you know, sometimes the distance between merely hearing God's Word to where we're actually living it out, how many know it can be universes, galaxies apart? Are you with me? Are you with me? If you can't say amen, say oh me. Universes apart. Especially if we've never allowed the word to move beyond the shallow surface of our own minds and sink far deeper in the soil of our heart because mark my words, it'll be just like what Jesus says here. That once you have received the word with joy, mark my words, it won't be very long when all of a sudden problems and hassles, storms and persecutions, trials and difficulties will start descending upon your life. And if that word, the word that God has spoken to you is just superficially sitting on the surface of your mind without any root, without any strength in your heart, it won't be very long before it begins to shrivel up and die. It's called the peril of a shallow and superficial mind. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people who've heard some great teaching on tithing and say, I'm going to be a tither from here on in. And so the first week they start tithing, they're all excited, they go to their mailbox expecting a check, and instead of a check being there, there's bills. And they say, it's not supposed to work that way. The pastor said that if you tithe, the Bible says if you tithe, God will open up a window from heaven and bless you. So much you can't even contain it. And I tithe and now I got bills. And so they pray again. And the next week they go to their mailbox looking for a big fat window blessing check. And there's more bills. And it goes on for a week and two weeks and three weeks and then a whole month. And then after they, they get into the midst of all that storm and they begin to wonder, well, I guess it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so rather than continuing to water the seed and deepen the seed, they just abandon the seed and it shrivels up and dies. And so the only action step when it comes to this one is making time for God's Word. You just got to make time. Taking the truths that are in this book and making sure they don't just casually linger on the surface and shallow places of our hearts and minds. Okay? It's doing whatever we must to see that God's Word sinks deep into our hearts. It's got to sink deep. Paul talks about it in Colossians 3.16. Let the Word of Christ... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Another word for that is deeply. In fact, the message Bible puts it this way. Let the word of Christ have run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your life. I love that. Let the Word of God have run of your house. In other words, the only way you're going to be able to fill your house and mine, your heart, your rooms, the rooms of your heart deeply with God's Word is you have to take the time. You need the time to do it. Time for it to sink deep and begin to produce the fruit that Jesus desires it to produce. Of course, that's not going to happen with just a little dip here and a little dip there. A little dip. I just dip when I got time. Just take a dip in the Word. It's not going to happen with little dips here, a little dip there, a little glance here, a little glance there. But rather, it requires a a, a scheduled time each and every day when, when we do nothing but spend time reading, meditating, study, musing, gazing, reflecting on the glorious truths that are in this book. It's going to require time. 
But the time is going to be well worth it because it's going to produce some awesome things in our lives. And so I want to encourage you when the 40 days are up that you would continue spending time in this Word. You know, I've been doing it for years. Clarice has been doing it for years, spending time every day reading the Word. And I don't read it just to get a sermon, okay? That's called pastor's disease, right? That's what we call it. We're pastors. Only read the Bible to get a sermon. That's a disease. That's an accident just waiting to happen. I read the Word so God can say things to me, not to you. He needs to straighten me out. And then after He straightens me out, then I can straighten you out. I've been doing it for years where I get up early in the morning, um, reading systematically through the Bible, and then journaling, writing it down. Remember, you, if you don't write it, you're not studying it. You're just reading it. And I write it down, and I, I write down what God says to me. And, that, and, and you know, an action... Uh, turns into a habit. A habit turns into character, and character turns into destiny. Action turns into a habit. A habit affects our character, and character has everything to do with our destiny. So if you're in your life right now, if you're at a place in your life right now saying, I would rather be in a different place, maybe I need to buy Lotto 649 and win $20 million because I hate where I'm at right now. I'll tell you there's a better way. If you're at a place right now in your life where you don't like it, you need to get some a action steps that are going to change it because action produces habits, habits, good habits, bad habits, but good habits. And, and good habits change our character. And when our character begins to change, we can't help but step in and walk in the greater destiny and plan and purpose that God has for our lives. Amen. And so we've been doing it for years. Matter of fact, we just came back from our 30th wedding anniversary. We went down to a resort where we didn't have to do anything all day for 10 whole days. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to do anything all day for 10 whole days. And we ate breakfast, lunch, and supper together because it's an all-inclusive. And I know I had to repent from eating too much, but um, that, that's why we had the fast afterwards. Good time to have a three-day fast. And you know, every morning we'd sit down at breakfast time and I'd say to Clarice, okay, what did God say to you in the Bible today? And she'd tell me. Because she's reading through the Old New Testament, I'm reading through the Old, we're following the, the, the same Bible plan, uh, the one-year Bible. And then she'd ask me, what did God say to you? And so that's how we spend our, our morning, just talking about what God said to us. And I know that, you know, we can't do that every day, right? I mean, our schedules don't allow for us to sit down. If it does, I would encourage it. I mean, by reading it and writing it and then talking about it, that's exactly what, Paul, but what God said in Deuteronomy. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so I would encourage you to do that because it, so, it was so awesome just to sit and talk about the Bible and how it related to each one of us. And so, so you know, the, 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 first, the first kind of soil is, is soil that's hard. It's a narrow mind. The second kind of soil is, is shallow. That's a, is a shallow mind, superficial mind. The third kind is thorny soil. This represents a preoccupied mind. Oh, man. And I think that out of all the different soils that are represented in this parable, this one right here, this one here is probably the most pervasive and insidious of them all, especially in our culture today. A heart, a mind, a life that is so plagued, so overrun with toxic weeds of diversion and distraction that God and His Word hasn't the room to grow in us thorny ground. And Jesus tells us exactly what these thorns are in the parable. You see it in verse 18. He said, the seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear God's word, uh, but are all too quickly, all too quickly the message is crowded and choked out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. The worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. One translation says it like this, but the seed is overwhelmed with worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to do. 
The stress strangles what they have heard, and nothing comes of it. The stress strangles the Word of God. And when I read that, I could just see, you know, the enemy of stress strangling those little sprouts that are trying to grow. It strangles it. And you know, if there was ever an accurate description of the day in which we live, this is it right here. People who are infiltrated and overcome by all the worries and cares, the desires and wants, the stresses and pressures of this life, so overrun and infiltrated that there is no way God's Word is ever going to take root and produce in their lives. Even though they want it to. Even though they have a a yearning desire to learn and grow and be transformed by it. I mean, they are so busy and preoccupied with so many things that before they even realize that the circuit boards of their minds have no more capacity. They're full and have no more capacity for God and His Word. And whenever I find myself slipping into this state of toxic distraction. That's the best way to describe it, toxic distraction. I force myself to take the next action step, and that is eliminating it. You eliminate it. I really believe this is the greatest battle facing Christians today. I really believe it. It, It's not drug or alcohol abuse. It's not greed or dishonesty. It's, it, it's not immorality and, and worldly living. Rather, I think this is the greatest attack on Christians today, the overwhelming wave of busyness and distraction that we find ourselves baptized in. That we go to work, and when we're done, we bring work home with us, and we're distracted. That we pick our kids up from school, and when we get them home, we proceed to drive them all around the city like a cab driver to hockey and ballet and jujitsu and piano lessons. I'm not saying it's wrong to take kids to those things, but I'll tell you, it just adds up. We have to buy supper, cook supper, eat supper, and when we're finished, we got to clean up from supper. That we have children that need to be changed, bathed, fed, and put to bed. Cars that need to be services. Pets that need to be cared for. Clothes that have to be bought, washed, and then taken to the recycle places to be used again. We have houses that have to be cleaned. And you know, as insane as all that is, and this is the double insanity of it all, that in the midst of it, we're listening to the radio and we're watching TV and we're checking our emails and we're tweeting on Twitter and we're picture-gramming our photos and we're updating our Facebook page in the midst of all of it. And we wonder why God seems so distant and so muted. Well, there's a good chance that he's been crowded and choked out, suffocated by a perpetually busy and distractive life. And that's why it's absolutely vital. We do whatever we must, whatever we must, to carve out of our schedule times that are free, free. Times in our schedule that are free from all distraction and stress where we can get alone from God and allow His Word to speak to us and to transform and change us. I taught on this several weeks ago. I I talked about, I I called it the when of the word. The when, the when, the when of the word. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who's in secret, and he who is in secret will, 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 will reward you openly. Notice Jesus said when. When you pray, he doesn't say if you pray, in case you pray, by chance you pray, but rather he had the expectation that all of us would understand the the day in which we live and how vital it is for us to connect with him and we would pick a time to pray every single day to pray and get into his word. I called it the when of the word, the when of prayer. And we talked about choosing our when and then keeping our when. But I want you to think about the quality of the when that you choose. Choosing your when and then making that when, in other words, that time that you have alone with God, making that time as distraction and stress-free as possible. Right? 
So you're not reading the Word and checking the stock market, right? So that you're not reading the Word and, and, and surfing on the Internet, not reading the Word and, 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 and frying, you know, the, uh, the bacon and eggs at the same time. That's hard, right? You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You're giving God what I call pure time. Time that is free of stress and distraction. And you know, it's the principle, and I don't want to spend too much time. It's called the principle of giving God your best. You give God your best. You see it all through the Bible. One of them is in Ezra 46, 14. Each morning you must sacrifice a one-year-old lamb with no defects as a burnt offering to the Lord. This was the commandment that the children of Israel were given by God, that every morning they were sacrificed a lamb without defects or blemish. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Pastor, how on earth, what on earth does that have to do with reading my Bible? Sacrificing a lamb? You know how expensive lamb is in the grocery store? Let's just try and get past the lamb and focus on the lamb without defect. It's the principle of giving God your best. And in the Old Testament, God asked for a lamb without blemish for the sacrifice. In the New Testament, he is asking us for the sacrifice of our time. I call it unblemished time. Time when we are most present and alert for him. Time when we can really focus and concentrate on him. Time with the least amount of noise and busyness and stress and distraction. That is the sacrifice that God is asking us to give him. The gift of our pure, unpolluted time. And that's how you keep the weeds out of your heart. Amen? That's how you do it. And so the first kind of soil is, is hardened. It, it's a closed mind. The second kind is shallow. It's a superficial mind. The third kind is stony, and that is a preoccupied mind. And then, of course, the fourth kind is fertile, and it represents a made-up mind, a made-up mind. Jesus said, here in the seed that fell in good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of six, 30, 60, even 100 times as much as they had planted. It's fertile soil. And I like how the writer of Luke puts it when he writes this parable in Luke 8, 15. Look at this. He says, but the seed in the good earth are the good heart. The good heart, what's a good heart? He says the good heart who sees the word and hold on uh, no matter what, sticking with it until there is a harvest. And I just love that. This is the good hearts, the good hearts who sees the word and hold on no matter what, sticking with it until there is a harvest. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about having a made up mind when it comes to God and his word. That's how you produce a harvest. It's a mind that says regardless of what I might be facing in my life right now. And in spite of all the difficulties and painful things that are coming my way, I have my mind made up. And that means that I am going to take hold of God and His Word. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to cling to it. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to seize it until I see the full harvest of what he has promised to me come manifested in my life. That is the power of a made-up mind. That this, it's an attitude it says, despite the darkness and discouragement, and some of you might be in that place right now, darkness, discouragement, fear, intimidation, trials and testing, battles and storms, criticisms and persecutions, doubt and unbelief, regardless of where you find yourself right now, a made-up mind says, I'm going to hold on to the promises of God until they bring forth the harvest of breakthrough and blessing and victory and fruit that he said it would. That is fertile soil. That's what it's all about. The action step is choosing to have a trusting mind. 
you just trust. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust what God has told me in his word, and I'm going to hang on to it until it comes to pass. David said in Psalm 1-1, he said, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, nor stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers. They delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. This is word integration. And as a result, it says they are like trees. Trees planted along the riverbank. In other words, their roots go deep. They're not dependent on what is going on around them. They're like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Each season, whether the seasons are good or bad, they're bearing fruit. Their leaves never wither. They prosper in all they do. How do you get that place? It's the power of word integration as we meditate on it and never let it go. It's the fruit of a made-up mind. Paul said in Philippians, hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly to it. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Hold firmly to the word of life. That is a made-up mind. And the writer of Hebrews says, let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. God always, God always, God always, let's say that together, God always, God always, God always keeps His Word. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. Why? Because God always keeps His Word. And I don't know what you're facing right now in your life, I don't know how violent the storms are. I don't know how hot the fires are. You know, I don't know how deep the valleys that you are going through. I don't know. I don't know. But one thing I do know is that you never want to let go of God and His Word in the midst of the hard place. Never. Matter of fact, that is the time you hold on to it even more tightly. And when all hell breaks loose, that's not the time to turn your face towards God and, and say, well, God, I guess you let me down. When all hell is breaking loose, that is the time you get out the promises of God. You stay in the Word of God. You integrate it into your life because you can be sure when the storm's clouds finally dissipate, you're going to come out deeper, stronger, more victorious than you ever have before. Your life far more integrated in your Word than it's ever had. Amen. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 4, Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. You might be here saying, Well, Pastor, just how long do I stand? Because I've been standing a long time. You stand until you win, and you'll win if you stand. As long as you're standing on the foundation of God's Word. You stand until you win. And I'll guarantee you, you will win if you're standing on the precious promises, the unshakable truths of God's Word. You'll win every single time. Amen? And so those are some of the ways we can integrate God's Word into our lives. I want you to think about that for yourself. Because come midnight tonight, 40 days turns into 41. And if we leave this series half-hearted, oh, it's over, on to another series. This is more than just a series. This is a campaign. This is an all-church initiative so that we could take the truths that are in it, apply it to our lives, and take an action that will turn into a habit which will affect our character, which will lead us into the very destiny that God has for us. This is one of the most important things we can ever talk about as a church. And so I want to encourage you. As you're studying the Word, getting into the Word, if you fall, get back up. Some people, you know, they have a Bible plan, and they say, well, you know, I missed that day, and I missed that day. Oh, man, I missed those three days in a row. What's the use of doing it? Might as well forget about it. You know what my attitude is? is if you miss days, just forget about it. Start fresh now. 
If you fall down in your Bible reading, dust yourself up, off, get back up and get at it again. It says a righteous man falls seven times, but the Lord upholds him. You say a righteous man falls seven times. You know the Bible, se- the number seven is symbolic of God's number. It's complete. It means complete. Here you have a guy who's falling seven times. He's a complete klutz, right? He's just falling all the time. He can't seem to get his life together. But you know, even though he falls, he's a complete klutz. He falls over and over again. He dusts himself off, picks himself up, and he chooses to keep at it and going at it again. And that is where transformation happens in our lives. Amen? Amen. I want... um, the worship team to come, and they're going to sing a song. This is a reflective song. And I want you just to, to let uh, your, open your heart and allow the words of this song to sink in deep.
why don't we stand? And I know we've run out of time, but let's pray. Father, I pray that you would, uh, you would visit each one of us here. And Father, that you would infuse us with greater strength and grace. Father, that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit enabling us to do what we can't do in ourselves. Father, making us steadfast and determined, tenacious, to hold on to you and your precious promises, regardless of what comes in our lives. Father, may that anointing rest upon each and every one of us. And Father, today we shake off the, 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 the cloaks of discouragement and and despondency and father apathy and complacency and father we shake those things off and we pray that the fire of your holy spirit father would fill us father and cause us to be the people you've called us to be and we pray it and we thank you for it and everybody said amen, amen. well let's give the lord a call.